Okay. So, so everything that's said from this moment on is going up onto the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Waylena, you, I'll have you watch the waiting room while I give an introduction here. All right. Welcome, folks, to the Starkle Planetarium's uh, James B. Kaler Science Lecture Series. Um, we're glad you could join us virtually for one, another one of these. Uh, this is our third session we've had during this academic year, um, and we have always get great speakers, and I'm really excited to see uh, what uh, Dr. Hatum has to offer for us this evening. Um, as you folks can already see, she is sharing her screen. So um, nevertheless, I guess I should introduce myself as well. I always forget to do that during these things. Uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm the director of the Starco Planetarium. Uh, with me here as well is our show producer, Waylena McCulley. Um, we're both on to act as moderators for this talk. And Waylena is also going to be running the next talk that we have at eight o'clock. That one will be like our Prairie Skies shows that we give roughly every two weeks, the tour of the night sky. Um, but we're putting a very special focus on the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Perhaps you might've seen that on social media, read some articles about it, uh, something like that. We actually even published one in the News Gazette just last Sunday. Um, so, uh, Feel free to stick around after Dr. Hutum's talk for more, okay? Now, um, our speaker for tonight is Dr. Esma Hatum Aslan. Uh, she is currently, since August, an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology at the University of Illinois. Um, before that, she had actually worked as a professor of biology at the University of Alabama. Um, as for her educational background, she did earn a BS in molecular biology at the Florida Institute of Technology and got an MS in biochemistry at the American University in Beirut and got her PhD in biochemistry at Cornell University. Um, before joining the University of Illinois, she also had postdoc training because that's what all professors have to do nowadays um, at the Rockefeller University. I, is that in New York City? Is that what I found? Yes, about? in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yep. Um, where she had investigated mechanisms of the bacterial immune system called CRISPR-Cas. Perhaps you've heard about that. I believe the um, people who won the Nobel Prize this last fall actually had done lots of work in that as well. Um, nevertheless, as you see, uh, today's talk is going to be talking about bacterial viruses. Um, now that might sound contradictory because you hear about bacterial infections and viral infections, but you're gonna hear about how viruses can actually infect bacteria with all of this. It's pretty wild stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. There is already a question here uh, from Annie Althaus uh, actually asking us about the YouTube link. Um, we uh, have actually a channel on YouTube for the Starco Planetarium and that's where all the videos will go. Um, and we'll be sure to post uh, that link from time to time on social media just to remind people to head there, okay? Um, so uh, I believe I hopefully covered everything I needed. Did I miss anything? Uh, no. I okay, no, wonderful. Not at well, all. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for that introduction and really for the invitation to speak here tonight. I kind of wish I could actually be at the planetarium right now, um, but we'll have to take my extra bedroom uh, instead. So welcome to the extra bedroom in my home. And I'm thrilled to be able to tell you today about a little bit about some of the work that we do. I'll cover just a tad bit of the actual details of some of the work we do with bacterial viruses, but mainly I'll be going over sort of the big picture of why we care about these viruses. And so the way that there's really no structure to this, and this is the way I typically like to anyway, you know, um, talk about my work is more like through a conversation. And so if you have questions come up, about anything that I say as we go along, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box and I'll pause from time to time at a natural stopping place and I'll ask Eric if there were any questions posted. So I'll, I'll be able to address those as we move along. And also I believe there's an option if you'd like to ask me your question directly, um, raise your hand and Eric can call on you as well. Okay, so bacterial viruses, why do we care? 
So I'm going to start with a, a problem, a global problem, actually. And it has to do with the rise in antibiotic resistance in bacterial pathogens. So I know right now the whole world is obsessed with a certain viral pathogen, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. Um, but in the background and ongoing for decades, we've always been fighting bacterial infections. And we typically use antibiotics to do that. And in our lifetimes, uh, you know, antibiotics are usually a sure thing. You get an infection, you take the antibiotic, the infection clears, it's no problem at all. But we are coming up into uh, an age where there is an antibiotic resistance crisis. And so you may have heard about this, but it was the first time that the CDC actually recognized this was in 2013, where they um, published this big write-up. And I have it referenced down here. So wherever I'm getting my information from, just look to the lower right for references if you'd like to go back to those documents. But they published on this uh, the very first time in 2013, and the CDC declared antibiotic resistance as one of the nation's most serious health threats. And so I'll just pull out a few statistics from this document. It turns out that in this country alone, there are over 2.8 million people each year that get antibiotic resistant infection serious enough to warrant a trip to the hospital. And of those people, every year, at least 35,000 people are dying as a direct result of these infections. And this is actually an underestimate of the total number of people that actually perish because this number doesn't take into consideration those who go into the hospital for a surgery or for some other procedure. And in the recovery room and ICU, they end up with an infection that is antibiotic resistant that complicates their recovery and actually can also cause death of the patient. So that number doesn't really take uh, into account uh, the seriousness, I think, of this uh, issue. So many more are dying because of complications. And so in addition to the cost in human life, there's also a cost, uh, you know, an economic cost to these infections. And the government is also concerned about these. It turns out that $20 billion a year is spent in excess direct health care costs to treat these infections. And on top of that, there's $35 billion a year lost due to lost productivity at work. So when you're in the hospital, you're not at work. And so there's a loss in productivity in, in the country. And these are statistics just for the United States, but the World Health Organization has also recognized antibiotic resistance as a serious crisis. And so I'm gonna pause here because there may be a question. We do have a couple here. Um, there's one from Pete Miller uh, about how many genes do your phages have? That might be coming up later if you want to answer that then. <laughs> and then Mark also asked about examples of common bacterial infections aside from staph and strep. So, yeah. So I can uh, touch on answers to both of those in case um, we don't exactly get to cover the answers to those precise questions. So how many genes does a phage have? It can vary uh, tremendously. So um, phages can have, the, at least the ones that we work with, they can have as few as 20 genes or over 200. And those are just the set of phages that we work with uh, that infect staph. Outside of staph, there can be phages that um, have many, many more genes. Um, but I think about 20 is uh, the lower end of, of the number of genes in a phage. And to answer the question about other antibiotic resistant infections of concern, um, Acinetobacter baumannii is a big one. Clostridium difficile is another big one. But um, whoever asked that question, if you want to uh, just pull up that reference that I have uh, written down at the bottom here. If you just Google CDC and this title, you should come up with two documents. And I would recommend going to the 2019 document, which is the updated one. And it gives a list of about, you know, top three main uh, bacterial pathogens that we need to worry about. But then there are some 16 or 17 additional pathogens that we also need to worry about if you want to know the more comprehensive list of threats. I put the link into the chat now. Lovely. Thank you. All right, so what do I, yeah, so how, how does antibiotic resistance spread among the population? So this is another image that I pulled from one of these uh, pamphlets that the CDC put out. 
And I think many people are probably familiar with the route that's shown here on the right, where you, know, you have a group of people in the community, how were they getting exposed to antibiotic resistant bacteria? Well, there are gonna be some members of the community that get an infection and they get treated for that infection. And so they're showing this person, poor guy here is having developed an infection and then he undergoes treatment with antibiotics. He might need to stay in the hospital where he's exposed other patients in the hospital to his bugs. Um, he's also exposing potentially the healthcare workers to the bacteria that he has in him. And as a person takes antibiotics, the antibiotic never kills 100% of the bacteria. There are always a few members of the bacterial population that have natu naturally acquired a way to resist the antibiotic. And so antibiotics are not gonna kill all of the bacteria and those few that do survive will then proliferate very quickly and overtake the system. And so this person who has undergone antibiotic treatment is surely now harboring some bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics that he took. He'll return to the community and continue to potentially spread those bacteria to others in the community. And so on the right, it shows sort of the people hospital pathway. But on the left, many people may not be aware of this huge additional source of antibiotic resistant bacteria from agriculture. And so it turns out that farmers for decades have been dosing their farm animals with antibiotics as both a preventive measure and also I believe a way to, um, I don't know, facilitate more muscle production in cows. And so um, antibiotics have been used as sort of a, a, a um, just a preventive measure to keep the animals overall healthy. And, all, and throughout all those decades, the bacteria inside these animals then are becoming more and more resistant to the antibiotics. And people become exposed to those both through the meat that they eat from these animals, but also through the uh, manure, which can potentially be used as fertilizer for the crops and the crops get to the people. And so that's how the antibiotic resistant bacteria spread. And you probably have heard of, you know, this recommendation to preserve and conserve on our antibiotics. We need to stop overusing them. And, um, but even if you yourself have never used antibiotics, there are all of these different pathways to where you've been exposed to antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so it's a problem for potentially every one of us. Um, so I wonder if there's a, a question before I move on to the next slide. We have another one from Pete. Uh, mm -hmm. Do bacteriophages have MASS DNA or DS DNA? Um, Can they have single stranded or double stranded DNA? Uh, oh, I didn't even it depends know on the phage. Yes, so different phages have different configurations of DNA. These are all great questions. I need to hurry up and get to the phage stuff. All right, so I'm building up to why we care about the phage. So antibiotic resistance uh, is there. And the, the fact of the matter is it's, it's not a matter of if resistance is gonna develop, but a matter of when resistance develops. And so this is a timeline that shows up at the top years that each of these different antibiotics were deployed uh, in the healthcare system. And at the bottom, it shows the years that resistant bacteria that are resistant or that have evolved resistance to the antibiotic have appeared in the healthcare system. And so for each of these antibiotics at the top, you can sort of follow the timeline and see when resistance was uh, developed in patients. And so everybody knows about penicillin. It was one of the very first antibiotics that we ever used in this country. And um, right around 1940 to 1945, it was deployed uh, in the healthcare system. And a little bit after 1945, penicillin resistant bacteria uh, evolved and patients were coming to the clinic with an infection that no longer responded to penicillin. So you can follow any one of these antibiotics and see the year that it was deployed and uh, shortly thereafter, you'll find the year that the same antibiotic pretty much became uh, useless. And so the longest running one that I could see here is erythromycin, which was deployed between 50 and 55. And then here between 85 and 90, you find resistance. And so, it's not a matter of if resistance is going to develop, but a matter of when. And so just to jump to this very next slide, which really directly to this, you might be thinking, well, why don't we just find new antibiotics? We're finding them all the time. 
Well, this is the problem with finding new antibiotics. We've pretty much, at least using the standard way to find antibiotics out in nature, we've pretty much exhausted the supply. And so where do we get antibiotics to begin with? We get them from soil dwelling bacteria um, that are use antibiotics as chemicals to battle with other bacteria in the soil. So um, antibiotics are actually produced by bacteria or by plants as a way to kill uh, predatory other bacteria. And so we have uh, developed ways to go into the soil and isolate these chemical compounds. And even you can go into the lab and tweak their structures a little bit and to make them more effective. And, but at the end of the day, the antibiotics have come from nature. And um, this is a timeline showing the different time points when all of these different antibiotics were uh, discovered. And so you can see that in the beginning, there were quite a few, especially in this area over here between 1940 and 1960, it was a very prolific period. A lot of antibiotics were discovered, but then you see that kind of dwindling a little bit. And then from 1987 and onward, there is this period where no new antibiotics have been discovered, no new classes of antibiotics. This is called the discovery void. So based on the traditional methods of going out into the nature and discovering new antibiotics, we've pretty much exhausted all of the, the new things that we could discover that way. Well, I put a little asterisk over here by 1987 to remind me to mention that back in uh, 2015, there was a report that came out in the journal Nature on a new type of antibiotic. They called it Tyxobacter. And they discovered it in a brand new, using a brand new method, this little nano, uh, I guess it was a different kind of a device that they were able to put into the soil and they discovered this new antibiotic. Um, but it is, I think it's still currently undergoing clinical trials. So just to mention that even if we started, you know, we found a new way to find new antibiotics and we found a bunch today, it could take many years before those drugs make it to market. So that, that trip from the uh, bench to the bedside can be many year long process and it can cost millions of dollars. And so um, this really, you know, hopefully underscores the need for us to find alternative treatments, uh, something that's uh, different from a chemical compound to treat our bacterial infections. And so before I, I move forward, there may be questions. We got two in the audience here. Uh, uh -huh. One from Jessica Conroy, are antibiotics also related to fungi? So fungi can produce antibiotics, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, then one from Pete again. Uh, when gene editing bacteriophages, um, do you use selection markers? If so, what type of selection marker? So the way that we edit phages using a CRISPR system, we do not need a selection marker. And I would be very happy if people wanted to um, communicate with me afterwards. Um, I can share my email address. It's online also um, at the University of Illinois. And we can talk more detailed and in depth about how uh, we use CRISPR to engineer phage, but there is no selection marker that we need to use. Yeah. And then one question I had actually thought of, um, based on how long it took for the evolution of these, um, of these bacteria before we started to see an antibiotic resistant bacteria, I actually don't know the average lifetimes of some of these bacteria. So like, if we're talking about these antibiotic resistant uh, to penicillin, how many generations was that over those five years? So it's hard to know how many bacterial generations, many bacteria, at least under laboratory conditions, their generation time can be as little as 20 minutes. So mm -hmm. that's what I know for E. coli. So wow. once every 20 minutes they divide. But now bacterial evolution within the human body, that's kind of a black box. We don't know their generation oh, time. Wow. That's a yeah. great question actually. And so it's, it's hard to know um, how many generations it took for the bacteria to figure out the antidote to penicillin or any other drug. Um, but, and, and so clearly that's, that's going to bear on how long it takes then for a drug to become obsolete uh, 
Um, but I just don't know the answer to that question. Oh, that's yeah. fine. I was just, I was looking for some, uh, you know, order of magnitude scale on that, but you can also just answer, well, the number of generations was enough. <laughs> enough. There you go. However many trials it took to, you know, for nature to come on the right combination of mutations for the bacteria to survive. Okay, so hopefully by now I've convinced all of you that there is a pressing need to find alternatives to antibiotics. And so that is the main course of what I wanted to talk about today, phages, the viruses that specifically infect and kill bacteria. And so here on the left, I'm showing a panel of phages that um, infect uh, a bacterial uh, genus is called Yerwinia. Uh, and so I just pulled this from a publication because I really like this picture. The uh, microscopic images are very clear and it gives you an idea of the different morphologies, the different shapes uh, that they can take. Um, the majority of the phages that we know of actually have this sort of head and tail structure. So um, the head, otherwise known as the capsid, is where you would find the genetic material of the phage. And then there's a tail attached to that as well. And the tail is the what recognizes the surface of the bacteria and the portal through which the DNA is ejected. And so pretty much 96% of all phages that have ever been discovered and imaged to date um, look like these with a head and a tail. And so there are some though more rare varieties that are a little more amorphous. They might not have a tail, but have icosahedral heads. There are some that are filamentous. They look like plates of spaghetti. I feel like I should have put some of those up there as well. But this is actually a representative of what the majority of the phages look like. And just getting back to uh, one of the questions as, that was act, asked earlier um, uh, to, uh, in regard to what types of genetic material can be encapsulated, it can be DNA or RNA. It can be double-stranded or single-stranded. It can be linear or circular. So pretty much every type of uh, genetic material out there that's available, you can find in a different type of phage. So these viruses are natural predators of bacteria. And here I'm showing uh, an electron microscope image of a poor bacterial cell that is being uh, attacked by a bunch of phage here on its surface. And if you look closely, you can even see some phage particles have, having already been built inside this bacterial cell. And if we take a step back and think about phages in general, they are considered the most abundant entities on the planet. And so there are an estimated 10 to the 31 phage particles on the planet. And to give you an idea of um, how big that number really is, maybe appropriate to this audience to say that last I checked, there are about 10 to the 21 stars in the observable universe, unless that number has changed. So, which means that there are 10 billion times more phages on this planet than there are stars in the universe, at least in the observable universe. So that's a lot of phage. And if you look in soil, you'll find phage, you know, they're, they're inside of us, they're on us, they're in the soil, they're in water. And if you take a sample of soil and you count the number of bacteria and the number of phage in that sample, you'll find that there are 10 times more phage than there are the bacteria in that very same sample. So they typically outnumber their bacterial uh, host. And so, the way that they work, I've, I've just drawn a little cartoon diagram. So if this is your bacterial cell, the phage attaches to the surface on a specific uh, receptor on the surface. And then they inject their genetic material and they replicate. And they typically don't have their own machinery to make RNA from their DNA. Some of them carry their own DNA polymerases, which copy their own DNA. Um, but they definitely are using the cell's ribosomes to make their own proteins. And so they, they make their head proteins and their tail proteins and assemble them all together. And one phage goes in, 10 get assembled and they burst out of the cell. So you can imagine how this process is very destructive for the cell. And uh, many phages basically kill their cell host through their own replication. And so these things are so microscopic, how do we see them in the lab? Well, the way that we look at phages in the lab is much the same way that um, 
they were discovered basically by uh, Felix de Harel and Frederick Tort a hundred years ago now, but we use the same experiments, types of experiments to visualize these uh, viruses in the lab. And so at this point in the talk, I usually like to have a little baggie, a Ziploc bag with some bacterial plates that I pass around. <laughs> but uh, in lieu of that, I have a picture of some auger plates where um, bacteria were grown here on the plate on the left. And if you put a little bit of bacteria on this plate the night before and you incubate it in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, over one night you get this nice even lawn. And so that grayness is actually a bacterial lawn, a crust of bacteria that even covers the whole plate. This is what happens when you don't have any phage mixed in with your bacteria. But here on the right, when you have a phage present inside that starting culture of bacteria, the next day, as the bacteria overnight are replicating, the phage replicate along with the bacteria. And then the very next day, you'll see interrupting that lawn of cells, these tiny holes. These little holes are where the cells have died because a phage, a single phage the night before replicated again and again as the, as the bacteria grew. By the next day, you see this visible plaque. So that is a plaque on a plate. And that is evidence that we are actually working with phage. And so this is a very common type of process that we use to um, identify the presence or absence of phage through uh, the formation of a plaque. So I'm going to pause here because I, I think I've said a lot now, but are there any questions in regard to what I've just talked about? I don't see any additional questions. I see some okay. observations. Okay, lovely. Yeah. So early on when phages were discovered, it was immediately recognized their potential for being used to treat infections. And this practice was called phage therapy. And it was commonly used even in this country before antibiotics hit the market. And um, because antibiotics back in the 40s, penicillin was so effective against uh, infections, pretty much any infection, um, phage therapy was left by the wayside because at that time people didn't even really know that phages, you know, what, what was the cause of this bacterial death on the plate, that it was actually a virus doing it. And so, but there are some parts of the world where this practice can be used. Um, in, in some parts of Eastern Europe, the Republic of Georgia, which is north of Turkey, for example, they only ever used phage therapy to treat patients. Um, and I, they never were able to take up antibiotics. And so now, because we are faced with this antibiotic resistance crisis, there's definitely a renewed interest in using phages or phage encoded proteins as alternatives to antibiotics. And there are a number of advantages to using phages over using antibiotics. Um, one happens to be their specificity. So one of the downsides of antibiotics is that in addition to killing the bacteria that's causing an infection, they're also killing all of the good bacteria that we have in our system as well. And so they're nonspecific, but phages are very specific to a particular host. They only infect one kind of bacteria. And the other thing that's a plus about this is that they are self-regulatory in that once they've cleared out their host bacteria from the system, they too can no longer replicate and they'll get cleared from the system. So they're self-regulatory and they're for the most part considered harmless to animals and to the environment. So there are many advantages to using phages over antibiotics. And just to illustrate the effectiveness and the interest basically in using phages, even in this country, um, I'm just citing here a paper that came out in Nature Medicine. Um, it's probably at least a year old now, um, but it's a story, it talks about a 15 year old patient with cystic fibrosis who received a lung transplant and then got a mycobacterium abscessus infection in her new lungs. And so this is a very uh, serious condition. Uh, it's not possible to take out the lungs and put in a new pair. And so the uh, infection did not clear with all kinds of antibiotic treatment. 
And there was a group of scientists, um, Graham Hatful is very notable for working with mycobacterium uh, phages that infect that, that particular genus of bacteria. And so a group of scientists put together the phages they had in their collections and tested them against the specific strain of bacteria in this patient. And they found three phages that could kill that particular bacteria. And they administered the phages to this patient in a cocktail. And to my knowledge, she survives today. So all of the, most of the signs of infection had um, been eliminated by the phage and uh, she continues to survive. So um, this is one of the success stories that we have uh, in recent uh, times uh, for using phage therapy to, to treat a, uh, an antibiotic resistant infection. So I'm gonna pause here before I move on and see if there are any questions from the audience. Mark has a question. How many bacterial cells in one of those gaps on the ag agar plate? Well, so the gaps are filled with dead cell material and teeming with phage. And so it really depends on the type of phage that you're working with, but I would estimate that in one plaque, you can probably get a, at least a million phage. Wow. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then Jeff has a question. Um, Maybe you can read through it. It's a little longer, but I'll, I'll attempt. That's fine. Phages currently attack only bacteria, but could they be genetically modified to attach other cells, e.g. cancer cells? Though if we go down that road and allow them to attack cancer cells, perhaps they could mutate and start attacking healthy cells. So phages are very specific for bacteria. And not only just any bacteria, but like their specific genus and sometimes species of bacteria. And so it's very difficult for a phage that infects Staphylococcus, for example, to infect Escherichia coli, another type of bacteria. And so a jump from bacterial cells are built very differently uh, when compared to human cells. Um, I hate to say things are impossible in science. <laughs> But this is one of those things that I, I would feel 99.999% certain that that could not happen for a phage to infect a human cell. Yeah. At least not in the typical way by attaching to something on the surface of the cell. Okay. Was that? That's all of them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So um, even though we're getting uh, in recent times in this country, success stories like the one I have up here, um, there are still many challenges and limitations to using whole phages as therapeutics. So um, phage therapy has not been approved for routine use, um, not in the United States and not in the European Union. And there are many reasons for this, there are many challenges. So one of the issues has to do with the effectiveness. And so bacteria are known to evolve resistance. They evolve resistance to antibiotics and wouldn't you know it, they evolve resistance to phage as well. It could be either through random processes where they acquire a random mutation in the surface of the cell where the phage attaches to, so then the phage can no longer attach. Or we're beginning to realize that there are a bunch of different immune systems in bacteria that are specifically geared towards fighting phages. And so CRISPR-Cas is one of those, um, but there are a bunch of others as well. And so the way to overcome this issue with effectiveness is to use, instead of a single phage, a cocktail of phages. So bacteria can easily become resistant to one phage, even in a test tube under lab conditions. But then if you add three phages together or five phages or as many as 12 phages I've seen in, in these cocktails, it, it becomes much less likely for a bacteria to solve the problem of 12 different phages and all at once come up with the solution to resist them. So that's great. We can use cocktails and that, that's typically what uh, works in phage therapy. Uh, but then that leads to another concern surrounding safety. And so phages, if you, there are many phages now um, in the databases where uh, the government likes to collect sequences of all organisms, including phages. 
And so um, if you look at the sequences of phage genomes that are deposited in these different databases, on average, you would find half of their genes have functions that are unknown. Like we have no idea what half their genes are doing. It only takes so many genes to code for like the phage head and tail proteins and the DNA polymerase, which copies the phage DNA. So most phages will have those, but then, some, you know, the majority of them have, you know, can have at least twice as many other genes that are doing other things that we, we don't really know uh, what they're doing. And so one can imagine uh, safety concerns surrounding these unknown genes and, and uh, have potentially some downstream side effects. So that's one safety issue. Another one has to do with how we can purify phages away from uh, the toxins that are present in the bacteria. So the way that we grow phages in the lab and, and the way that they're grown uh, and prepared before being used in a therapeutic application is the same. You basically put a little bit of bacteria inside some broth and you spike that with a little bit of phage and you let them grow and incubate together. And over time, the bacteria grows, the phage will infect and kill all of the bacteria. And so you end up with a nice clear soup, but what's in there, there's a ton of phage in there, which is great, but there's also the bacterial guts. And many of these bacteria also produce toxins, which then spill out into the phage preparation. And so those have to be painstakingly purified away from the phage preparation. And um, it is possible to do, but that leads me to the next issue of the manufacturing challenges, how to get these high yield, high purity phage preps at minimal cost. So minimal cost is key here because in order for phage therapy to become a routine practice, we really need industry to get excited about this and involved in the production of phages. And if a process is not going to be economical, they're not, it's not going to take hold with industry. And finally, um, there are issues with FDA approval. So phages aren't like the typical uh, chemical compound, which um, are antibiotics basically. So they're, they're not a chemical compound. They're, um, it's debated whether they're alive or not, but there are different dynamics when a phage enters into a person's system that is completely undefined. So um, where they end up inside the body, how quickly they replicate, those are all unknowns. And the FDA likes to have very well-defined components in their drugs. And there are very high standards for purity as well. And so I know that there's a lot of interest on the side of the FDA as well to um, establish new approval pipelines to help uh, bring phage therapy uh, in as a more routine practice. So these are some of the challenges. And I wonder if there are any questions surrounding these, any of these areas? Nothing has come up, but the floor okay. is open. Great. So I'll press on and tell you a little bit about what we do, because a lot of the things that we do in the lab are geared towards helping to alleviate some of these challenges and concerns. So we study the interactions between phages and their bacterial host. And I'll talk specifically about the bacteria that we work with, the staphylococci, in a second. Um, but this is just a big overview of the types of things we do in the lab. We do a lot of basic research. We're interested in understanding the immune systems and the side of the bacteria. We've discovered some new bacterial immune systems. We're interested in discovering new phages and how they work. So the idea here is that the more we know about the bacterial immune systems, the more likely we are to be able to engineer therapeutic phages that can overcome them. And every new phage that we find out in the environment is a new weapon that we can potentially use to combat an, a, an antibiotic resistant infection. And it's also a new tool that we use in the lab to study and, and probe the bacterial immune systems. So in addition to the basic research um, that we do in the lab, I'm also very interested in promoting education around this idea. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, in the last few slides about my phage discovery course, which I taught at the University of Alabama. And I'll be starting up here at Illinois as well, where students actually go 
into the environment, collect samples, and we find new phages and we characterize those phages and we're establishing this new bank of phages. And I've also partnered with Carolina Biologicals and we've developed an educational kit, uh, this module, um, where students can work with bacteria and phage um, and learn more about CRISPR and other bacterial defenses. Something else that we do in the lab is wherever it makes sense to develop new technologies to enable phage therapy. For example, we have developed a method to engineer uh, specifically staphylococcal phages, but it can be used to engineer other phages genetically to make better therapeutics. And we've also developed a device that uh, basically delivers phages uh, to the site of an infection just as the infection is mounting. And so all of these efforts are geared towards combating, combating drug resistant pathogens. And one thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, antibiotic resistance is not just a problem for people, it's a problem in agriculture and it's a problem in veterinary medicine. There are antibiotic resistant bacterial pathogens that are also problematic uh, with crops. And so phage therapy really, there's a lot of potential to apply this to many, many different areas. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do in the lab, specifically with staphylococci. Before I get into that, I wonder if there were any questions that popped up. Got a couple of questions. One coming from Pete. Uh, he has asked, sorry, I have to let in my boss. Oh, I guess Waylena caught me and caught it before me. Um, when you edit gene, when you gene edit phages, do you edit a plasmid with the phage information on it and then grow the edited phages from the plasmid? Oh, uh, Asma, you've muted yourself for a moment. Am I still mute? We hear you now. <laughs> you hear me? I didn't touch anything. I have no idea how that happened. Oh, that was probably my fault. I know. What okay. We, we <laughs> Lena had let in somebody in the waiting room and it had, I had accidentally clicked on the very next thing after the thing popped back okay. up and that was me muting you. That's so it's entirely my fault. I forgot that I did okay. that. No worries. I'm very excited to buy that question actually, because that's exactly what we do. Uh, when we use crispr edit phages, we uh, clone on a plasmid the sequence from the phage that we, we want the phage to take up, basically. And so we do use a plasmid um, in combination with a CRISPR system. So you, you give the phage basically the, the sequence that you want it to take up, and you also target the CRISPR system directly against the phage at the location that you wanted to take up the sequence, if that makes sense. I'm not really gonna talk about this this evening, um, but that's how we select for phages that have naturally recombined with the plasma sequence and taken on the desired edits. So that's very perceptive of whoever asked that question. And I'm happy to talk more um, with anyone who wants to go more into detail about any of this. You can shoot me an email and we can set up a time. Sure, all right. Um, so we've got a question from Mark, and he feels that it's a complicated question, so I'm going to allow him to unmute himself, and he will ask it now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Yeah, so my question has to do with the point you made about uh, the possibility of a bacteria developing a resistance to phages, mm -hmm. and I was kind of wondering how that happens, and um, I don't know much about biology, but um, I, I want to draw a, an analogy with the novel co uh, coronavirus, which is, I understand it has these spikes that code for a protein in certain human cells called ACE2. Mm -hmm. And so I presume that that particular virus is very specific to the human cells that have ACE2, which probably- Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the so, receptor that they're binding to. Mm -hmm. Right. So is it the kind of, so this, this resistance development, would it be that the bacteria somehow would learn how to operate without whatever the equivalent of ACE2 would be? That is exactly right. So one of the most common ways that we get resistant bacteria, when we look in the bacteria to see how it became resistant, it would modify the receptor or its surface in some way 
So there are two things. If it can live without the receptor, it can lose it altogether and grow very happily even in the presence of the phage. And under laboratory growth conditions, bacteria have the luxury to do that because we feed them a very rich broth. So they can go without a lot of their receptors that they wouldn't be able to go without in, in nature, basically. And so the most common way in the lab that we find a bacterium has uh, overcome the phage infection is by basically the bacteria doesn't do this on purpose. It's a, just a natural evolutionary mechanism where as bacteria replicate, there are random mutations throughout the genome, the subpopulation, or even if just one cell randomly acquired a mutation in the phage receptor, that one has a key way to survive against the phage. And one becomes two, becomes four, that cell will divide and divide and it can overtake the whole culture now. So that is exactly how uh, phage resistance occurs in bacteria as well. Another thing that can happen that bacteria have been known to do is to secrete um, a capsule, basically exopolysaccharides to coat the surface and that helps hide their receptors from the phage tail protein. So the phage can no longer attach. Hmm. It's another way. Yeah. All right. You're free to continue. Okay, lovely. So I'll talk a little bit. Let me just keep an eye on the time. So I don't want to go over time here, but oh, I think I have to do that. So we are interested in staphylococci. So this is the particular type of bacteria that we work with in our lab routinely. Here I'm showing you some pictures of Staphylococcus aureus, um, and, and probably many of you have heard of MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And on the right um, is a biofilm forming uh, strain of Staphylococcus epidermidis. And just to give you a little fun facts about these bacteria, uh, MRSA is one of the pathogens on the CDC threat list, which is again cited down below. It causes infections from in the hospital that people can get from the hospital, but also out in the community. And these are the latest statistics. And these are estimates um, from 2017 alone that MRSA caused 323,700 severe hospital acquired infections. 10,600 of those patients passed away because of MRSA and $1.7 billion spent in excess healthcare costs. Staph epidermis is another pathogen. It's actually an opportunistic pathogen. We all have it, it's all over our skin. And in most healthy people, it doesn't cause any problems at all. In fact, it's known to have many benefits, but it is also the most common cause of infections associated with medical devices. So people with prosthetic joints, cardiac devices, catheters, um, staph epidermidis can be very problematic, especially when the implant is, is being put in place by the doctor because these bacteria are all over our skin. It's possible for the implant to brush by the skin and, and get on the implant. And um, some strains of staph epidermidis can form biofilms on that implant. Uh, if they do, that implant has to get taken out. It, it cannot be treated with antibiotics or through any other method. Um, and it turns out that today there are staphylococcus strains that are resistant to all known antibiotics. And so we're interested in finding new viruses that kill these bacteria. One thing I mentioned earlier was my phage discovery course. So we've been doing this now for the past several years. It's a research-based lab course where um, in the very first week we go on our field trip to the wastewater treatment plants and uh, it's the best place to find staphylococcal phage. And why wastewater? Because um, you typically want to look for a particular type of phage. Uh, you look in the places where its bacterial host naturally resides. And in this case, we're looking for staph phages. So we look on people because that's where staph resides. But there is an enormous amount of red tape to go through to get permission to even of a person's skin and see if the, I can get phages out of that. So we realized we can just go straight to the source, the grand cesspool of all human samples. It's free, no approvals necessary, and grab some of that sewage. And it's great for finding phage. 
And so we take those samples back to the lab. Um, we do some plating assays and we, we do auger plates, just like I showed you in the picture. We look for plaques on those plates coming from the wastewater. When we see a plaque, we get very excited. We know we found a new phage. And throughout the semester long course, we uh, basically purify phages from the wastewater and we can look at them under the electron microscope. So these are a couple of very excited students who have seen their phage for the very first time. Um, we also extract their DNA and we sequence it and we do other things as well. We, we, we figure out what it has in the genome. And so we've been doing this now for several years at the University of Alabama. And over the course of that period, we've discovered dozens of new phages that infect Staphylococcus species. And, and I'm showing some of them here. And you can probably tell that the students get to name them who discover them. <laughs> they all look a little bit different from each other, but um, in the poster, you may recognize this from the uh, seminar poster, um, they all, they all come in, you know, the majority of all known phages basically, but these are staph phages come in three different flavors that I'm showing here on the left. So you have the smallest variety, the family that, that they fall into is potoviridae. And they have really short tails and they have really tiny capsids, uh, less than 50 nanometers across. The next size up, you have the siphoviridae variety. They have long flexible tails. And then the next size up is the myoviridae variety, and they have about 90 nanometer diameter capsids. And myoviridae are special because they have these long rigid tails, but they also can retract. So under the microscope, you see this uh, version of the tail as well. And you'll notice that the head here is darkened because it's lost its DNA at that point. So it's not only retracted, but the DNA has been injected. And so they have this injection mechanism, kind of like a, a tiny nanometer scale syringe. And that's how they get their DNA into the cell. So this is just an example. Do we have time for this? We have like eight more minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, so just an example of a type of experiment that we can do in the lab to assess how effective a particular phage is. And this is a, a comparison between the myoviridae and a potoviridae phage. And I'm showing their images here. Um, I'm just comparing the effectiveness at killing the bacterial host. When you're comparing potoviridae phage, uh, originally it was called V2 because the name Vidya uh, isolated it and then later she named it Andra. And um, versus this other myoviridae phage, ISP1, which had been previously isolated by another group. And I have uh, put these images to the same scale. So basically one of Andra can fit inside the capsid of this big guy over here. So this one is a lot larger than Andra. And so um, the question is, which one is more effective at killing bacteria? And so one way we can test this is by looking at plaque size. And so when you plate them both, uh, Andra actually forms plaques that are quite a bit larger than ISP. There are plaques on this plate, but the image doesn't quite uh, pick, pick it up. They're really tiny pinpoint plaques. So that was early on an immediate indication that Andra might actually be a pretty effective phage. So the next thing that we can do is grow the phage in culture. And we measure the turbidity uh, of that culture over time. And so as bacteria grow in this clear broth, um, over time, the broth gets cloudier and cloudier. And so we can measure the cloudiness of that broth by using a spectrophotometer and we take the optical density measurement. So that's what we're showing here on the Y axis is the optical density at 600 nanometers. And on the x-axis, we have time. So this is over a 12 hour period. And if you focus on the blue line in each of these graphs, over time, the blue line is just showing the, uh, the uh, growth of Staphylococcus bacteria. So initially there's like a flat line, there's a little bit of a lag phase, but then all of a sudden you get this exponential jump in um, turbidity, in uh, cloudiness of the broth. And then eventually, so that's the exponential phase. And then eventually the bacteria stop growing and that's called the stationary phase. And so if you set up a tube of broth, the bacteria alone, the blue line is what you see in its growth pattern. If you set up a separate tube at the same time, but this time right around three hours, you add the phage. Uh, 
this is what happens. This is the red line. You see a little bit of exponential growth of bacteria and then crash. And so this is what the phage is doing. It's basically clearing out that broth again and killing all of the cells. Phage ISP also causes a crash. The crash happens a little bit earlier here, but you'll notice hopefully that there's a rebound here for phage ISP where you begin to see resistant bacteria picking up and starting to grow again. Whereas over the 12 hour period, you don't see any rebound with phage V2 or Andra. And so we're very excited about little phage Andra and, and other potoviridae phages like Andra um, because they are so effective, but also because they're minimal, they're so small. This is on the smaller side that I was talking about earlier to address that question. How many genes does Andra have? It has 20 genes. And we know what over half of them are actually doing. The majority of the genes are to, you know, there for building the new phage and for replicating the phage. So we can identify functions for over half of Andra's genes. So we have about eight or nine genes to figure out what they're doing. And then we're done with Andra. We, we can say we've defined it. And um, its genome is less than 20,000 nucleotides in length. So, um, this is the last slide I have. I don't know if I have time for it, but I wanted to, do I have time? This will probably take two more minutes. So I just wanted to kind of end with the common immune systems that are found in bacteria. And um, this kind of touches on a question that was just asked earlier. And so um, the typical pathway for a phage is to attach to a specific host, inject, inject its uh, genetic material and then replicate. And I talked about some passive ways that bacteria can, can use to overcome phage infection through passive mutations. But there are also a number of bacterial immune systems that, I mean, even here alone, I think we're, we're, there's been an explosion of new types of immune systems. So the most common mechanisms of immunity, actually one of them I uh, mentioned uh, in answer to a previous question, was uh, having to do with surface modifications. So one common way that bacteria can defend against phage is by secreting a capsule that can prevent the phage from finding its receptor that it attaches to. Another very common mechanism some of you may have heard of is restriction modification. These are very common. Uh, they're found in about 90% of all sequence bacteria. There's one or more of these systems. And so they're composed of usually two proteins a methyltransferase, this M over here, and a restriction enzyme, the R. And so the methyltransferase actually you can think of as like a little painter that paints chemical modifications on the host genome. And the restriction enzyme, this red guy over here, is like a pair of scissors. It cuts specific DNA sequences. And the way that this enzyme is not able to cut the chromosome of bacteria is because these little dots of chemical modification prevent it from acting on the bacterial genome. There is another type of immune system called CRISPR-Cas, and um, it's an adaptive immune system. And it's a very exciting new area of research um, where basically a CRISPR, like the CRISPR locus in the bacterial genome is like a molecular memory. So what this system does is it captures little snippets of every invader and plugs it into the CRISPR locus and it's maintained as part of now the bacterial genome. This is a memory of past invaders. And so these little pieces of DNA are transcribed into small RNA and that small RNA um, binds with Cas proteins and together they form a complex. And that little piece of RNA is like a wanted poster. It's looking for a match to the sequence that was previously encountered. And when it does find that match in the phage, the cast proteins will cut that DNA. And so the spacers, the, these little um, pieces of foreign uh, DNA are constantly being updated as the cell encounters new invaders. And the last type of mechanism I'll, I'll talk briefly about is abortive infection. And so this is a very common mechanism. Many different things go on in this arrow that you can't really generalize what's happening, but the one generalization you can make is that the cell detects that it is being invaded by a phage and then it triggers a pathway that leads to cell death. So that way the, the cell commits suicide, it's sort of an altruistic suicide, 
that prevents the phage infection from spreading to other bacteria in the population. So just real quick, I wanted to thank you all for your attention and just put this picture here of um, my group in the three days Alabama before we had to all wear masks and socially distance. And so this is my new crew here. Um, I had four brave souls come join me here at Illinois and we've been getting the lab set up. Um, we just moved in August. And so um, I should credit all of these uh, young scientists um, for, you know, I didn't get to show really much of their work at all, but just wanted to give a shout out to my group here and also the, the funding that we've received over the years. Um, thank you all for your attention. I'm not sure if I have time to entertain questions. We're right at eight on the dot. So I'll leave that up to you, Eric. We will happily open it up for some more questions. There is another one from Pete here. Do mm -hmm. you use Cas9 for gene editing or are there other versions of CRISPR that work better for gene editing phages? That's a lovely question. So everybody is, uh, the majority of applications are derived from Cas9. Um, it's a, a very specific, more minimal type of CRISPR system. One we have found very useful for phage editing, I'd like to call CRISPR-Cas10. It's a type three system. It works uh, beautifully for editing phages in staff. And I would argue that it is ideal for phage editing and it works better than Cas9. So absolutely, there are other systems that are. Okay. Folks, do you have any other questions for Dr. Hatuma Aslan? All right. Um, Lovely. Well, we have some folks who have been signing on for the last few minutes because they're here for the next talk mm -hmm. for the uh, for the Fall Prairie Sky Spotlight on the conjunction coming up. Uh, Ask Esma, you are welcome to stick around and watch that. Or, but nevertheless, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this for us and for answering all those great questions that we had in the um, in the chat. Um, I see some people are waving their hands, maybe using the the uh, the clapping <laughs> reaction. There's mine right there. See, I never get it to match, but there you go. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. As I, thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, this was great. And we hope that we can get you to come back again when we uh, can uh, meet in person again. I would, I would love to. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so much. All Bye, right. everybody. Enjoy the next show. <laughs> okay.